And there will be a point in time in your life where you can have big aspirations and you physically can't do it at some point in time. And that is where you start to spiral down the regret and I should have and once I... I believe that if you really truly have this thought that you need to be doing something different, impact, improve, whatever it may be, then you need to act on it when you have the physical, the mental capability, maybe financial capability to do that. And one thing can fuel the other. The entire reason I can take a massive loss on that conference is because that real estate business fueled that loss because I didn't need to focus on getting, scraping every dollar I could out of that so I could focus on one thing, which is how do I bring consistent value? But if everything fails, I'll still be one of the top real estate agents in the city. And I can go back to doing that. Now, I'm, everything won't fail because I'll take everything to zero before it fails. But God forbid, something needs to happen. We get some family emergency. I got to make some cash. Like, you're still already good. You've proven that you're great at one thing already. You can always go back and do that. That's everyone. Oh, there's no safety net. The safety net is your experience in one area. I bet you still have people reach out to you from time to time. Every day. Yes. <laughs> yes. So what, what would happen is something happens, God forbid, somebody reaches out. You know what you say now? Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that. Not, hey, I've got someone I can refer you to. No, it's, yeah, I'll be over at three. Evan Stewart is a master strategist, trainer, and expert closer with years of experience running his own multi eight-figure book of business and helping others do the same. We are here with Evan Stewart in Dallas, Texas. And before we start, we have to say that uh, we definitely have the best venue for any podcast that we've done. (laughs) So now we're going to have to uh, be able to beat this because we have three, four ping pong tables, two pool tables. We have an empty bar, empty restaurant. We have bowling lanes. Um, man, That's we might just have good. to turn this into a studio. This uh, is great. I was about to say, yeah, I wonder what it would cost to com- come back to this space again. That's hilarious. <laughs> so Evan, tell us who you are, but more importantly, what I want to know is what do you believe in? Absolutely. That's a good question. Uh, well, my name is Evan Stewart, and I believe that everybody has an ability to be better than they are, but few people actually have identifiers in their life to help them achieve it. So I am the person that helps people identify and live a life in alignment with their giftedness instead of defaulting to their weaknesses. I believe most people are living in default just through comfort or complacency or mediocrity or a lack of an ability to challenge oneself. And I'm not to use the word redundantly, but I'm obsessed with helping other people find and live in their obsessions. Sweet. And before we keep going, I'm going to ask you to move that phone off the table. Without a doubt. And then what I, what I really want to know is tell us a little bit more about your background, mm. how you found your obsession. Yeah. And for anybody that's listening that doesn't know what they're doing or they think that they're doing what they're supposed to be, mm. how can they identify what they're obsessed about in mm-hmm. a good way? Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I want you to get into that secondly Talk to us about the two different types of obsession. Mm, that's good. That's good. Well, the, the, if somebody is struggling identifying where, if they are living a life, as I call it, that's in alignment, if they're not, the first question that I always have is at the end of the day, are you full of, like you might be physically exhausted, but are you full of energy or are you drained of energy? Yesterday, for example, I got home. Physically, I was really exhausted. I mean, we just had a hard push with the obsessed conference and you know, that comes to a T and then, and then you just have this moment of breath, but mentally, I mean, I was meeting with the team. I was talking with people like I was on fire. We're here today. I mean, we're pushing, pushing, pushing because that alone gives me so much internal motivation, desire to do more, be more, have that energy. So that's the first big kind of red flag of you become a just walking, talking, exhaustion conversation where everything is just, oh my gosh, it's overwhelm and it's anxious and it's stress. If you're living a life that constantly puts you back into that space, chances are you're not living in true alignment with your giftedness or your obsession. There's friction there that people don't always identify, but most of us live in. What I was, what you referenced, what I talked about the two different types of obsession is we have a healthy obsession and we have unhealthy obsession. An unhealthy obsession specifically stems from these feelings that we have that are pretty dark actually there's you know abandonment and there's there's feelings of isolation there's feelings of non-acceptance there's 
guilt and their shame. And a lot of people, they'll, they'll change their life because of a guilt or a shame or a feeling of inadequacy or abandonment. But in reality, that change doesn't lead to anything other than really a lack of fulfillment and regret. And so what I believe is that those types of obsessions are highlighted. In fact, when people talk about obsession, usually we think of like literal drug addictions and alcohol addictions and sexual addictions and all of these dark things that no one wants in their life. But that's where the second part comes in, which, which is healthy obsession. And obsession first is an emotion, it's second a mindset, and it's third a discipline. Emotion is the moment of revelation. It's that not the, the sky opening up and God saying, Jonathan, like your life is about to change. No, it's the, the revelation is just a moment that you have where your perspective changes so drastically you can never look at one thing the same again. And then the second is the mindset. Okay, now I have this revelation. Now I'm in the mindset. I need a stage of preparation of how do I prepare my mind, my body, and my spirit in order to fully live in alignment with this with this obsession that was given to me in this moment of revelation. And then the third is, is the discipline, which is a stage of cultivation, which is, okay, now I have the revelation. I'm moving towards something. I'm preparing my mind, my body, and my spirit. I'm working. I'm getting a little more consistent, building habits, you know, rituals around this, becoming a disciple to that obsession. Now that third stage of, of discipline, how do I continue that, that focus, continue that work to make sure that all this work I put into it will eventually produce a harvest? And that cycle, it's a three-arrow cycle, worked consistently and frequently produces what I call obsession overflow, which is the stage of saturation. And that's the abundance that a lot of people are chasing where you say, okay, my, my family's legacy has an ability to be different in the future because of my ability to be a disciple to my obsession now. What I found is the thing that I'm obsessed about mm -hmm. is helping other people. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I know that is because back in Oh man, it's been eight years now. Mm -hmm. I won the presidential service award from President Obama. That's right. Okay. And after that, I was still in the army and I was going into the real estate business and I started getting caught up in accolades and mm -hmm. success. And what I found was I had a business that I loved, mm -hmm. but not a life that I loved. Yes. And I had to really back off to what I tell people now is I help you create a business and life that you love. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm obsessed about because yes. there's too many people that are with an unhealthy obsession mm -hmm. chasing leads, Yes, right? That's not, you're obsessed about leads. Right. You're obsessed about marketing. You're right. obsessed about, no, you're, you're obsessed about something else. And mm -hmm. these things are trying to get you there, but you're looking at it from the wrong way. So how do yes. we create a business and life that you love? Mm -hmm. So then that way you can, work towards whatever you're passionate about. You can do something that you actually love because, mm. you know, for me sitting across the table in the real estate space, I would tell people, if I'm a realtor in 30 years, I've failed. Yes. I am not going to be a realtor oh, in 30 years. I'm so glad you mentioned and that. I, and, and if I tell you that, I'm lying to you mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons, but that's not what I'm obsessed about. I'm obsessed about helping you. Yes. I'm obsessed about creating this life that you love. Mm -hmm. Real estate mm -hmm. is allowing me to do that. Mm -hmm. However, there are other things that I'm gonna be doing in my life. So first off, if you're looking for a realtor that has 40 years of experience, I'm not your guy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in my short amount of time, this is what we're going to focus on. And this is mm -hmm. what we're going to achieve through the, the, through the sell of your house. There's so many more things that we can tap into. Absolutely. There's a lot of agents listening right now that want to create this business that they love, mm. but in order to create a business and life that they love, mm -hmm. what would be a piece of advice you would give to them? Mm, gosh, you, you, you touched on so many powers. And you're going to have to realize that I do that all the time yeah. and you can cut me off and you can do whatever you want. But I, I, I'm obsessed about tons of things, so I talk a lot. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I love it. And, and the reason why I, I love the fact that you touch on that, and before I answer that question, I want to answer one other, which is you, you mentioned I'm not the person that's going to be offering 40 years of experience. And in the real estate world, knowing a lot of your audience are people who are working in that field, there's nothing wrong with that, but there is also nothing wrong with building a business you can exit. I am seven-ish years of experience in my real estate business. I started that business with the intention of leveraging that into something different. I didn't start that business with the intention of being a realtor. See, self-employment means you're an employee of yourself, not that you own a business. Because if you can't walk away from your business and it runs behind you and it doesn't actually produce a lack of income because you're away from it, then you don't actually own the business yet. You, Gary Keller, 
one of my favorite quotes by him this year was, he said, you start losing so slowly that it feels like you're winning. Mm. And I think that's profound because in real estate, what happens is, is that we get caught in the minutia of our daily work and we get caught in the, the BS of, oh, I, I own a real estate business. No, you broker sales. You are a salesperson. It's just that under the business you're working in happens to be your name on the front. And I'm not saying that to discourage. I'm saying that to focus on the reality, which is that a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, why would you ever want to exit? Why would you want to do this? Your life should consistently be pushing you towards something greater. And your success in one area should be pr propelling your success in another area. Internally, whether it's relationships, whether it's family, whether it's people in your life that you want to give back to, or externally, whether you're going to take your career in one area and push it into success in another, push it into success in another. So if that's a point of friction, if you're listening to this and you're thinking to yourself, maybe you're nervous to take that step. I encourage you to at least explore it. And for me, I mean, it is scary. You know, when I, I got into real estate and I thought, okay, I wanted to build up my business. I wanted to have a big, you know, book of business and all of that. And over seven years, we built it up to where, you know, I'll run a, a multi eight figure book of business and we work with some great people and some great product. And okay, now we're here. And so the conversations are people saying, well, why would you want to leave that? Well, because that is propelling Obsessed Academy, propelling Obsessed Conference, allowing me to do as the same as you, what I love, impacting, improving the lives of other people in a more profound way. So why wouldn't I use success in one area to push into another? Now, going back to the question that you had actually asked, which is how might you be able to start identifying, correct? How do you create that, that business and life that you love? Yeah, mm -hmm. what's that first piece of advice which it could be, hey, you need to identify exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, what, what's your piece of advice for somebody that has a great business, not necessarily they have a bad life, mm -hmm. but how do they get both in alignment, like mm -hmm. you said, so then that way they truly understand what they're obsessed about? You know, I think that people that are living lives that aren't actually giving them what they're looking for, like you said, well, you're not maybe obsessed about this one thing. This thing is kind of the mask for something deeper that you can't quite get to yet. When people talk about work-life balance, it's usually where people go and they start to say to find a life that you can, you know, start to bring you that inspiration, motivation, excitement. But, but balance doesn't exist anywhere. Usually what we're saying is I need to stop sacrificing the things I care for for the things that I don't, but the things that I don't, I believe, are putting me back into the right environment of the things that I care for. So you feel guilt when you're working because you're doing something you don't want to do to be able to provide for those that you should be providing for in a way that drains you so much that when you're back to be with them, that you're not having any level of giving your best self back to those, per that back to those people. And then when you have the opposite, which is now you're not doing that, you're not working as a professional anymore because you are supposed to be spending time with these people, but you're so drained and so guilty because you're supposed to be. And so we're in this tension that I think a lot of business owners live in, but very few actually are willing to put that on the table and say that this exists. Have you felt that in your life even? Definitely. And, 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 I, and I have too. And so there's a term that I call threads of consistency, which is that I believe understanding life will be imbalanced. It might as well be imbalanced in a way that can continue to give you energy, like I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast. So that way you're fueled and you're the best version of yourself when you're with the people you want to be with. And a thread of consistency is whether intentionally or unintentionally, all throughout your life, I believe at points you have been touching, touching, touching your giftedness. And if your giftedness is an ability to help other people find, identify theirs, for example, you can think back. I remember all the way back to when I was a kid, literally in kindergarten, I, I was helping people, um, you know, with not people that were getting bullied, helping them find friends and find placement. And, oh, well, you're good at this. And I'd noticed someone was good at it. And I'd say, well, maybe you should draw more. And, you, and just at the time, it was just you know, offering advice and being a good friend. But in reality, that was me and my giftedness kind of crossing for a moment. And so when I think back into that, and when you're thinking back into your life, if you're listening to this, think are, what are the moments that keep coming up again and again, the concepts that have been driving your actions intentionally or unintentionally that leave a stickiness in your mind, an imprint on these moments in your life from when you were young to a little bit older to adolescence to teenager to adult, and you can start identifying these concepts, okay, impacting and improving the lives of other people, helping other people, being a good friend, being supportive, driving community. And that can start give you action steps, that can start giving you the action steps on what you should be doing, in my opinion. So you look at that, you say, okay, I've got these concepts in my life. Now, what are some things I can do as a professional which allow me every single day to start touching those concepts intentionally? And then when you move with intention, you start to identify and you 
work a little bit and you get a little more refined. And then before you know it, over the course of three years, now 90% of your life is with intentionality, trying to align with those things that really you feel you should be doing. So you start to eliminate the guilt, eliminate the friction. And just by default of working in that arena, now you're giving a better version of yourself to the people that deserve you. And you're working more efficiently and you have more energy and more fuel. And so your life starts to feed itself instead of eat itself. Does that make sense? Definitely. What I like to tell people is if you ask somebody what you do, Mm -hmm. if you are in an elevator and you're talking about, you know, something, Mm -hmm. you'll really know somebody is passionate about what they do Mm -hmm. when I use the term all the time when they start lighting up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. Right. So when I ask you a question on how can you help others find their stuff, you're going and I'm sitting here and I'm like, yep, this is it. This the, you know, I was sitting at the bar last night with a a few guys and Mm -hmm. we're talking about them being in the insurance industry, Mm. but I can tell that they do not like being in the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. They're here portraying that they want to be this best insurance person, but I can tell this is not what they like. And I would say, who are you? What, what are you protecting first of all? And who are you really doing this for? Because sometimes what happens, I love that example because a lot of listeners might feel that on the inside, whatever they're doing, insurance, real estate or not. And the interesting thing about it is that when you, when you look at people like that, we on, as people who try to inspire, impact and improve those, those lives, we can look at them and we can say, well, then, then why? Like, it just doesn't make sense. But in the, the reality is sometimes you're so far down that rabbit hole that like, let's say you hate what you're doing, but you're making half a million dollars a year. Your kids are used to eating a certain way. Your wife is used to driving a certain type of car. And it's really, really scary to remove that environment because, you know, what else can duplicate that income? Well, it's going to take a lot of hard work. And so now you start to get into this reality where you justify through sacrifice of, well, I need to provide this for my family. So therefore, I'm going to sacrifice my life in this way in order to give them what I think they most need when in reality, what the people around you most need is the best version of yourself. And you're depleting that by working in a way that drains who you are, you know? Definitely. So for somebody that is going through that to identify, you know, if they're doing something that they don't love, Mm. if they're doing something that doesn't make them light up like a Christmas tree, Mm -hmm. what would be the first step that that person should do to start creating a business and life that they love. Oh man, this is so good. So I say this with a caveat, so please don't pause right after this statement or you're going to completely screw up the interpretation of this. (laughs) (laughs) Take the leap to something you want to be doing, but that is not an instantaneous jump. Don't run into your office in leather underwear, waving a Confederate flag saying I'm out of here. I mean, like, People say burn your bridges, but, and I talked about this on my podcast a few weeks ago, just kind of a a rant about this whole concept of taking the leap, which is take the leap, the leap, the emotion, moment of revelation, decision to start moving, but the movement can take years. And I, that we want to pause on because there's too many people out there that are telling you to quit your job, that are telling you to rip up your contracts, that are telling you to do this, but they did not do that. No. It took them so many years to get where they're at Yes, for them to, yeah, go to the next person and say, I'm done because I'm doing this. That's fine. They're in a position to do that. For anybody that is listening, we're not telling you stop being a real estate agent. We're not telling you stop being an insurance agent. We're not telling you to, to stop doing that. However, we are telling you to take the leap, to start figuring out what do I need to do? How do I map this out? How do I make this possible? Because you're not going to make it possible by just quitting and you're not going to make it possible by winging anything. So in order to create this business and life that you love, you, you have to map out what does that look like and then start Mm -hmm. backwards because just like all the ad platforms work now, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. YouTube, they all work the exact same way. Let's start at the end. What is your objective? You want leads? Do you want brand awareness? What do you want? Okay. That's what you want. Now let's work towards that. If you really want something, map it out Mm -hmm. and then work towards it, but keep going on. Uh, I I want you to keep going on this topic because Mm -hmm. I'm, I get very, you can say like almost heated about it because it's like spark that because I hate it. I hate when I hear people get on Instagram and say, Hey, what's up? You know, if you're really, if you're doing something you hate, you just need to go tell the boss, like, screw you. I'm going to go do this. Well, they do not do that. And they did not do that. They can do that now. 
because you know if you got a hundred mil in the bank account, yeah, of course you could do well, that. And there will always be work that that is. There will always be work in your life that you dislike doing. Always be work that you dislike doing. And I told somebody this morning, you might not like what you're doing right now, but that is going to fire you to do what you're going to do in a few years. So mm-hmm. you're, don't quit. Well, it's is keep it the pushing. Mi- is it the minority or the majority? Right? Is the majority of your work things that you dislike, or is it the minority? There are still things mm. about Obsessed Academy that I don't like doing, but it's such a small point, and mm. the reward is so so energizes me. The people I work with, the team that I work around, that it makes it all worth it. You see, when you sit down and you can no longer justify your work, that is when you are living life in default. So when I say take the leap, we have this, this spread of years where you've got, if, if you're making half a million dollars in real estate right now, please don't, don't tear up your contracts. But instead of building to add additional substance and additional growth, you can build to exit. You see, when I made the decision years ago that I was going to exit the real estate industry, move solely into coaching, consulting, impacting, improving the lives of other people, I made that decision instantaneously. My work changed. I did not work less. I did not get senioritis necessarily. It just changed. Where instead of taking, taking, taking for me, I was now taking with two intentions. Number one, to build relationships with great people of quality because I'll be damned if I hand off a book of business that pisses somebody else off. And number two, I was building a business now in a way that was scalable and sellable by somebody other than myself. Love it. That type of thing. Love it. And I want to talk about your event. So Mm -hmm. for those listening, I'm here in Dallas. Yesterday I was with uh, Evan at the Mm -hmm. Obsessed Conference. And let me tell you, this guy knows how to run an event. Okay. This was his first major event. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Major event. And the the dude went all out, but all out (laughs) on the right things. The video boards, the lighting, the sounds, the the hype man, the everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you guys are thinking about putting on an event, you guys need to come talk to Evan because Mm -hmm. he's going to connect you with whoever he's going to connect you with, or it's maybe it's all in his brain, but (laughs) he's going to give you some answers because too many people are overshooting their first event because they think that the crowd needs these different things. However, what the crowd really needs is good speakers, but what they really need is a great experience. And that happens from the moment they wake up and have breakfast Mm -hmm. to the time that they leave the airport. Mm -hmm. How do we make it so they get a good experience? They get Mm -hmm. the information, they get there. They have great people sitting to the left and to the Mm -hmm. right of them Mm -hmm. who they're gonna talk to more. They have things just that I, I want you to go into it a little bit sure. on, on how you made this possible and uh, how long it took you. Mm-hmm. And for anybody that's thinking about, you know, putting on an event, um, you know, maybe a piece of advice that you would give to them on something that you did wrong mm-hmm. that I don't even know because mm. the experience was great. Well, the first piece of advice right out of the gate, which is if you're willing to do anything like that, just commit first and do it. But I have years and years and years when I was younger, I'd spent as you know, an actor in theater, you know, through school and that type of thing, never professionally. But there was a quote that came out of a a mentor I had in that space when I was younger that I love, which is even if they've seen it before, you might've seen Lion King a thousand times, they don't know how your version of it is supposed to go. You Mm. see, unless you tell them, the audience doesn't know that it's supposed to go a certain way. And in the theater space, you know, a lamp falls over and it's not supposed to, you got to roll with it because you can't do anything else. But in the space of conferences and performances, I think so many people get caught in their own head of, oh my gosh, they know, no, you know, and you should know, you should know every little screw exactly where it's supposed to be. I mean, really be detail oriented, but the audience doesn't know. That's the first thing. But when talking about the event, I think about it like a, like, (laughs) it's gonna sound kind of funny, but I think about it like you're a DJ at a club, right? So put yourself in that space for a minute. We'll get rid of all the grunginess and we'll just be in that space (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) so now we got a full club um but if you think about it you you're almost like djing at a club in a sense of where you want to listen to the people that are on the dance floor see how they're moving how they're reacting and tailor the experience to them but then also the people that are out there are expecting number one that they aren't going to be told how to work how to move how to think how to act but they want to be guided And so when you're doing that type of event, and my thought process was, how do we create an experience that is unduplicated? What can someone get through a relationship with our conference that they cannot get anywhere else? You know, tomorrow I'm gonna be speaking about referrals. Okay, so referability is huge in my business. That's how I built my book of business. You know, growing your bottom line 30 to 50% through referrals and relationships in everything we do. So how do we create an experience that's so profound 
that the only the only thing that someone has to say when they're talking about it is there's got to be a certain point in conversation of, oh my God, Jonathan, you just got to be there next year. And, and, and how do we do that? Like you said, don't overshoot. It's do what you do really, really, really well. And we're dreaming big. We were sitting down there yesterday. We had, you know, 150-ish people or so uh, at this first event. So it was really intimate, really good crowd of people, super energetic. But we're sitting down. I had an immediate debrief after, uh, after the event. And we're on the balcony and we're looking across. And we were in a small town called Frisco, Texas at the Dallas Cowboy practice <laughs> arena. So we were in a really nice event space, but we're sitting on the balcony. I'm looking at the arena. We're kind of talking. I pull up my phone and say, okay, that seat's 12,000. Like, how do we get there? So you can have those big aspirations, but taking the steps back. Well, before we do 12,000, we need to do 1,000. Before we do 12,000, we need to do 5,000. So I, I like what you mentioned there, Jonathan, about managing the growth and having proper expect. You can dream big, but that might be hit in three years instead of, you know, next year. Yeah, and I think that it's great for anybody that's planning an event to, to know that some of the events that you're going to that are phenomenal, mm -hmm. that's not their first event either. So yeah. don't don't plan your first event based off of somebody that's been doing it for 20 years mm -hmm. and they have all these things. Well, they have all these things because they've built it up and now you <laughs> know them for that. But your first event more than likely is not going to be that. Yes. And, and it's just like that in business too. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to work for yourself and you want to do these different things, great. Set your expectations based off of year one, year mm -hmm. five, year 10. Mm -hmm. Don't set it up based off of somebody on social media saying you can make a hundred million dollars next month. You know, maybe they can, but mm -hmm. you are not for the most part, you know, I'm making a, you know, broad assumptions, sure, but sure, I sure. think, I think that they're true. Um, you know, you have to really listen to the message and where it's coming from and decipher, okay, where were they at this stage? Yes. You know, if the event does have 50,000 people and has all these different things, okay, what was event one like? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, okay, we can execute on that. Uh, and if you want right? to get there, the other thing is you can't be afraid to spend money. I took a loss mm. in this event. A big loss. Yeah, for sure. I took a big loss on this event. I did not make any money. And I'm totally transparent about that. Why? Because we have real estate agents listening to this, obviously. If you're in real estate, I don't care how many times you hit a postcard, how many times you do a social media ad or a click funnel or, or text or call or anything, there is no better marketing than a sold sign in someone's yard. Mm. If that neighbor is driving down the street and it's sold, 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 Evan here, Evan here, Evan here, Evan here, they're calling me regardless of how many times you put a postcard mm. in the mailbox and vice versa. They're calling you if your signs are in the yard. If you're in the business of transforming lives, there's no better marketing than transformed lives, mm. which means don't be afraid to spend the money and take the loss now because that was my intention of, I'll take the loss and I'll go below zero now to have a room full of people that are now advocates for my brand that when I have big audacious statements like your life will change as a result of being in this environment and that happens, well now when they're telling their people, it is, we executed on every commitment. We gave them exactly over delivered what they were looking for. The experience was profound because we weren't afraid to spend money to make sure it was an unduplicatable experience. And now that loss now, the intention is it will be replicated in profit year and years and years and years in the future because we weren't focused on the pennies now. We're focused on the bigger money later. Mm. Does mm. that make sense? It definitely makes sense. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, some people will say, Jonathan, man, you have this great real estate business, right? You're ranked in the top percent mm -hmm. of the entire country, mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. making good money, mm -hmm. drive a nice car, mm -hmm. you live in a great city. Why would you change any of that? Yeah. And why would you accept less money? Why would you lose money? Mm -hmm. I said, because I'm going after bigger things, baby. Yeah. I'm going after huge things that I know are possible. So I'm willing to accept less money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, and and it's, not, it's, it's not that I'm losing money because I don't see it that way. I see it as I'm investing in myself to do something a lot bigger in the future that yes. is going to turn into a reward, not only for me, but for other people. Why? Yes. Because I know I can do something to help people mm -hmm. create a business and life that they love. If I can't do that, then I can't do that. That's not me. I might be obsessed about it, but if it ain't working, it ain't working. Well, you might as well try because you can always go back. And if you're listening, I mean, we've been talking mm. a lot about this transition and the jump and mm -hmm. you see people think, okay, well, <laughs> burning my ships and all of that, that's all fine and good. I'm not saying don't do that if that's what gives you motivation. What I'm saying is, is if you're a great real estate agent, you're making a million dollars a year, life is good, you're driving hot cars and you're unfulfilled and in your entire being, you really want to be doing this. You can always go back and be a badass real estate agent. Mm. But 
I mentioned something yesterday that I want to bring to the forefront is your body has to be able to work with what your mind can think. You're, you're, you have to physically be able to carry out what your mind can manifest. And there will be a point in time in your life where you can have big aspirations and you physically can't do it at some point in time. And that is where you start to spiral down the regret and I should have and once I... I believe that if you really truly have this thought that you need to be doing something different, impact, improve, whatever it may be, then you need to act on it when you have the physical, the mental capability, maybe financial capability to do that. And one thing can fuel the other. The entire reason I can take a massive loss on that conference is because that real estate business fueled that loss because I didn't need to focus on getting, scraping every dollar I could out of that so I could focus on one thing, which is how do I bring consistent value? But if everything fails, I'll still be one of the top real estate agents in the city. And I can go back to doing that. Now, I'm, everything won't fail because I'll take everything to zero before it fails. But God forbid, something needs to happen. We get some family emergency. I got to make some cash. Like, you're still already good. You've proven that you're great at one thing already. You can always go back and do that. That's everyone. Oh, there's no safety net. The safety net is your experience in one area. I bet you still have people reach out to you from time to time. Every day. Yes. <laughs> yes. So what, what would happen is something happens, God forbid, somebody reaches out. You know what you say now? Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that. Not, hey, I've got someone I can refer you to. No, it's, yeah, I'll be over at three. There it is. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk about your academy. Mm -hmm. I want people listening to be able to find you, find mm -hmm. your academy. Mm -hmm. And, and when they do, what can they expect from it? Mm, excellent. Well, I have an online academy. If you just go to obsessedacademy.com, you can find information on all of that. But it's an online training academy that goes deep into referrals, duplicating your best clients, mastering objections, positioning product, positioning yourself, dominating your market through retaining 97% of your listings if you're a real estate agent, all the way from how do we start and scale and grow ourselves and our businesses in a way that is going to allow us to be the player in our market instead of just being a player uh, playing in our market where you are the professional that people will compare to instead of just being lumped against somebody different and the biggest difference because there's a lot of training and coaching and whatnot out there but the biggest thing that i found when i needed this in that space was how like what are the concrete and actionable steps i don't want to tell you to you know find your why or oh you just need to you know call more people and knock on doors and all of that. No, when you walk into a listing presentation, what is the anatomy, the actionable one, two, three, four, five things you do in order to make sure that you walk out with a guaranteed signature 97% of the time? Mm. When I say that you need more referrals, how do you properly set expectations and drive consistent conversations to ensure that your best clients come back again and again and again? When I talk about mastering objections, why are you hearing the objections? Where are they coming from? What are, what's the mental framework around it? What's the anatomy of that environment? And then how do we speak? How do we react in a way that allows us to, without sounding like an asshole, move around the objection and into a close because we know that that close is the best thing for that client, that type of thing. So the concrete and tangible steps to that is exactly what the online university offers. I love it. So what's next for you? What's, what, what does the next year look like for you? What does the next five years look like for you? What's, what's going on with you? Oh, man. Well, five years, honestly, I've got big things on the calendars. But What would be uh, the biggest thing on that calendar well, in five I think years? By five years, if I can't get at least 12,000 people to a conference, then I'm doing it wrong. Um, I, I, I mean, Repeat it again. In five years, if I can't get at least 12,000 people to a conference, I'm doing it wrong. You heard it here first on the Real Advice Podcast with Jonathan Hawkins. So we are going to keep him accountable to 12,000 within five years. 100% we're gonna do that. So what does next year look like? So next year we've got, uh, of course, ObsessedCon 2020 is the first thing on my mind because we just got done with 2019. ObsessedCon. Obsessed mm. Conference 2020, that's right. So if you're listening to this, that'll be obsessedconference.com. We'll be re releasing tickets for pre-sale in the fall of this year, 2019. Um, so that's a big one, but I'm also finding a lot of other ways that we can bring value through intimate experiences. So mm. retreats, I've got some big partnerships on the calendar that I can't announce yet, but opportunities for you to get in an intimate environment with people of quality that were inaccessible to people that don't have those connections. So that type of information, those types of inspiring environments. Um, I'm doing a significant amount of speaking and one-to-one -one training and coaching and traveling, going to other businesses and whatnot. And so my biggest focus now is, okay, between now and the next 12 months from here, so summer of 2020, how do we 
bring such consistent and impactful value that our ability to bring different people and professionals to a higher level becomes a necessity for their business instead of just a, oh, well, this would be nice if you come in and give us a little hit of motivation or something like that. I want to give a shout out to a woman by the name of Nani Bernal, Mm -hmm. who asked me a phenomenal question. Mm -hmm. And she's just a phenomenal person Mm -hmm. who does a phenomenal podcast. So go listen to her as well. And the last question, and I'm going to end this with your last question is, dead or alive, three people that if you can meet with them over lunch today, who would it be? That is a good question. Um, one of them I would have to say would be Frederick Chopin because um, my years earlier when I was younger as a concert pianist, Chopin was the first one that I actually connected with as somebody who lived in a masterful obsession. Just to get inside that mind, that would be very, very interesting. So that's the first one. Um, I'm inspired by people that do great things. So I think I haven't had a chance to meet him yet, but I would love spending time with Richard Branson because Mm. he's somebody that is just... He was on my top three as well. Yeah, he's on my top three. Funny how that works. (laughs) Funny how that works. You know, one of my my number one principle is commit first, figure it out later. And you're talking about somebody that's done so Mm. much. (laughs) Not just... Funny how we think alike and you attract those types of friendships. You do, you do. And, And not just him as in, oh, you're great, but... I want to know about the systems, what it takes to maintain that type of obsession, like the systems around that to make sure that he can play at his highest level. Mm. Um, Who's number three? Hmm. God, that's and I question. love asking this question on the spot because when you ask this question or you prepare for this question, mm-hmm. you start doing some Google searches. You start yeah. thinking, who, you, if you name three, you're like, man, this, that you tells know, me what you believe. That tells me what you're thinking like. Who's I think, the third one? I think the third one... Uh, he's, is still alive, uh, Les Brown. And I haven't met Les yet. We've had, we've had events that we kind of cross paths and whatnot. And well, I guess we've shaken hands and whatnot, but I mean like sit down mm-hmm. with, because when I was transforming my life from a life living in default to a life in obsession, and I started going down the path as many of us do of personal development and continued growth and whatnot, he was one of the first speakers that I connected with that really resonated with me, that allowed me to challenge myself, change my mindset. And so just by being at the start of that journey, I've always had this connection to Les and, and his stories and what he speaks about. And so I would really love to spend some time with him. And actually, um, you know what? After this podcast, I'm going to reach out to his team. I think I'm, I need to do that. There so we go. I'll call him first. <laughs> Where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? If they have questions, if they want to just chat it up, if they want information, wh- where do they go? Absolutely. Well, I'm super active on social. You can find all... Well, me everywhere, but my handle is at real Evan Stewart, and Stewart is with an EW. Uh, if you enjoy conversations like this, opportunities to challenge yourself, impact, and improve your own life, I do have a show, The Obsessed Podcast, specifically for that purpose, and obsessedacademy.com if you want to get into an environment with high-class people, train, make sure that you can gain that unfair advantage many people are searching for, that would be the best place to start. For anybody that's listening, this is the last 20 seconds that they're going to hear. They didn't hear anything previously. You have a piece of advice that you want to give to somebody about something. What Mm. would it be? Honestly, commit first and figure it out later. That has been the number one thing that has allowed me to compress time and do so much before I'm 50 years old is if you're in fear, if you're worried about it, that's totally fine. Like I can be scared to death and still moving towards something, but you learn so much in the process, like just figure it out in motion instead of thinking and preparing. Because while you're thinking and preparing, there's somebody else that's maybe not quite as talented that's moving, and then they're the ones that are actually going to get the recognition. Hey, everybody. This is Jonathan Hawkins. Thank you so much for staying until the very end of this podcast. I definitely appreciate it. As always, make sure to reach out to me via social media at Jonathan Hawkins Official. Send me a comment. Shoot me a DM. If you have any questions, you can also comment below. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe below. And remember, who you hire truly matters.